So welcome, so welcome to Laws 1000P, Human Rights. This is uh, the final class for the semester, and we are so honored to have with us four uh, slam poets from the area and hip hop artists. And we would like to um, enjoy what they have to offer us. Um, they're gonna be speaking on uh, human rights and democracy themes and to bring out some of the, the themes and ideas that we've been discussing this semester. So this is kind of like a review as well. Um, and they're gonna be talking a little bit uh, before each of their pieces about where that piece is from, what they were doing, um, what they were thinking, where it comes from, what they're responding to, right? So I welcome them um, on behalf of the class and I would like Amanda to ask Amanda to come up and introduce you to them who they are and what we'll have is we'll have one round so they'll each perform a piece and then we'll have a moment for questions so think about the questions that you have for them um, and then we'll do another round of, of pieces and then we'll have some more questions if you have them so gather up your questions thank you Amanda okay so first off I'd like to thank uh, you four for coming in and sharing today um, first of all, I have John Akpata. Now, John is a writer, he's a musician, a radio show host, and a political activist. So, as a spoken word artist, John has appeared on CBC, and C well, radio as well as television. He has performed coast to coast across Canada, in the US, as well as the UK. Um, John has also released a full, a full length CD, it's filled with poetry and music, and it's titled titled Keheb. Keheb. Carib. Carib. Thank you. Carib. In 2005, that was completed with assistance from the Canadian Council uh, for the Arts, and in October 2010, at the Canadian Festival of Spoken Word, John was part of the Team Capital Slam, who became the national slam champions for the year. So congratulations. Yeah. John uh, is also a member of the Marijuana Party in Canada, and he has run in the last three federal elections. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, we also today have Danielle K.L. Gregoire. Uh, Danielle's a mother. She's a spoken word artist as well as an educator. Uh, she is the director emeritus of Capital Slam, and she's also the founder for the only English-speaking rural slam series in all of Canada. <laughs> Woo, again! <laughs> um, she seeks to empower youth, uh, speak out on feminist issues, and create spaces for people uh, to share their voice and to spread optimism through activism. Uh, she also has a CD as well, and it's called Optimism is a Constant Struggle. Um, next, we have Faye Estrella, or Festrel, <laughs> as, De as Danielle asked me to introduce you as. Um, Faye is a published freelance writer, and uh, she's a performance poet as well. Uh, she's the artistic director of Voices of Venus, and hosts uh, the monthly feminist showcase there. Uh, she also runs workshops on anti-oppression and spoken word and volunteers with various uh, social justice organizations. So another yay. <laughs> Thank you. And we also have Bonisi Zikali as well with us today. And Bonisi, he contacted uh, Professor Adrian about this event on the Carlton uh, website. So thank you for coming. And he's a spoken word artist from Zimbabwe and is a good friend of the, or like the outspoken, I guess, group and organization. And he is the artist who started off in this, oh, you started off in this class this year? No, so, oh. he's, so he's friends with outspoken okay. from Zimbabwe okay. that started off the class. Okay, Plus, remember yes. the first exactly. Remember yes, the first story. <laughs> class? There you are. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. <laughs> so I was a little bit confused. Yeah, he's, um, um, oh, use the mic. Um, he is friends with Outspoken. Okay. And perfect. so when he heard that we were doing this, this um, get together, he's like, I can't believe you're doing this. Sorry. And now he, called, he came. Okay. No, so no, no. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah, John, did you know?
Hello? Yes? Hello? Am I on? Yeah? Can everybody hear that? Or is that just for the cameras? Oh, that's just for you guys. Okay. So, that's great. Um, first of all, before I begin, thanks very much for, uh, for having us come in. Um, I went to Carleton. I graduated from Carleton with a degree in, it used to be called English Literature. I think they just call it English now. And uh, I actually used to bartend on campus at Oliver's for years and years and years. So I'm just a regular person like anybody else. And uh, I've been in Ottawa for about 13 years now. And just uh, the poetry led to some uh, notoriety. And that notoriety led to opportunities. And those opportunities led to more poetry. And the cycle continues. So I consider myself to be extremely fortunate to be someone who does what they do. Uh, I've got a couple of championship titles. That's wonderful. Um, but being able to travel, um, being able to connect with lots of different people, and being able to um, be admired and respected and perhaps even loved for what you do is a, a pretty fantastic thing. I can't remember the last time I had a nightmare. I sleep very well every day. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people that uh, take pills before they go to bed because they're worried about how much money they make. Uh, I don't have that problem. <laughs> so the first piece I'm going to do is a poem that I wrote for the 2007 CBC Poetry Face-Off. Uh, back in the old days of Radio Freedom, we used to have a thing called the CBC Poetry Face-Off, and it was a, a four-minute competition. There was five poets selected from, like, 13 or 14 different cities in Canada, and uh, they would give you a topic, and everyone would write a poem. You got four minutes, and they would play it on the radio, and then the winner would be played on the radio again, and they would have like a national uh, contest to see who won. So because I won in 2004, my one poem was played on the radio like three times, like coast to coast. And then they invited us back in 2007, and then in 2008, they said, no more, or was it 2009? 2009, they said, no more. No more poetry face-off. No more. And everyone said, why? Why not? How come there's no, mo no more poetry face-off? And they said, well, there's not enough poets in the Ottawa area for us to justify having the poetry face-off. <laughs> but we just had the National Festival here. You know what I mean? So I think it might have had something to do with freedom of speech, but I'm not really sure. So this is a piece that I did in 2007, and I dedicated the piece to a sweatshirt that I bought in 2006 from a store called Big Buds. When they went out of business, I bought this beautiful, amazing Nazi sweatshirt. It had the swastika and the iron cross and everything. It was fantastic. And I'm like, what the? How is this possible in 2006 that I can buy a sweatshirt for a toonie, even though these Nazi symbols are illegal in Germany and the Netherlands and France and England and America, all the southern United States is completely illegal even to make it and I bought it in Canada for $2, and I paid my tax on it. And I looked at the label, and the label said, Made in Canada. Here's the poem. You know that Canada has joined the New World Order? You'll need a passport and a retinal scan so you can cross the border. We train our troops in the snow and send them to war in the sand. They're little lap dogs doing the dirty work of Uncle Sam. Support the troops, yes. Let's have a draft. We'll make history with the military, but ignore the lessons of the past. Fourth Reich foreign policy says, shoot first, think last. Peer pressure in the war for terror, we can have our own Vietnam. Peacekeepers, thing of the past. Rwanda, Congo, Sudan, Somalia, don't make me laugh. You know, we are following the master plan. We are following the master plan like where exactly are the JTF2? Canada's Special Forces Counterterrorism Unit. We use attack helicopters and top secret troops to shoot black people in the back and then they cover up the truth. Jean Bertrand Aristide, je m'excuse. Sorry, my tax dollars were used to fund a military coup orchestrated specifically to oust you. Orchestrated specifically to oust you. C-I-D-A. Canada's intergovernmental underdevelopment and destruction of Africa, that's what I say, $12.4 billion operations on two-thirds of Africa's nations. Now look at the motherland after only two generations. There's infrastructural devastation, there's agricultural devastation, there's child soldiers, and an increase in AIDS. Don't talk to me about being saved by Stephen Harper and Stephen Lewis and Bill Gates, because I know why Health Canada has all those monkeys in all those cages. 
Eugenicist scientists mix sheep vista virus with bovine leukemia injected into their veins. When the virus mutates, they extract it, synthesize it, mass produce it, and use it to inoculate all those third world children that are living in a poverty state that the first world created in the first place. That the first world created in the first place. So why on earth is there so much hate against my beautiful race? I said, why on earth is there so much hate against my beautiful human race? It's because evil people are conceived in test tubes. They are raised in petri dishes in hermetically sealed rooms. They are cloned and mass produced. They are used to enslave you and rule you and fool you. But having never spent nine months in the womb, they are not connected to the heartbeat of humanity like me and like you. They run multi-billion dollar corporations that profit from human exploitation and weapons of mass destruction, just like SNC Lavalin does. It was Lockheed and Martin that did the last 2006 Canadian census. So when the Americans cross the border for water, who on earth will protect us? I said, who on earth will protect us? Don't forget about the oil industry. They supply the military with the cheap gasoline so they can fly halfway across the globe to kill people that are poor for what they know, what they grow, the resources under their feet, and what they believe. We come from a Santa Claus, Tooth Fairy, Easter Bunny country, and we are going to war against Muhammad, Allah, and their 1.25 billion friends and followers. I don't like those odds, and I don't like this war. So don't do it in my name, please. I don't mean to cause no harm, but will somebody please shut off that doomsday clock snooze alarm? Did you know that right now, NASA is using both Canada arms to build the Death Star? Call me a catcher in the rye. Like Dorothy, I have flown through a hole in the sky. I have been to the other side. I am Morpheus explaining that splinter in your mind. I've been backstage at the circus. I've seen behind the curtain, and I know the wizard only tells us lies. Minister, prime minister, prime sinister, has to wear makeup and mascara to hide his beady little eyes, has to practice making smiles to hide his evil desires. It's not a joke. Every day I use the rituals of smoke to cleanse my third, a, my third eye. Every day I read, write, meditate, pray, burn the chalice, and I seek the most high. I plant my poetry seeds in the ground, and I watch those trees touch the sky. And because I'm descended from the divine from time to time, I can read minds. I usually have beautiful dreams inside my eyes, but lately my thoughts have been disrupted by those wicked minds that have evil thoughts inside their insights. They sit around and fantasize about how to make money by selling us war. Then they build guns and planes and bombs and tanks. They recruit row after ranks after file after mile of shaved-headed, uniformed, muscular guys. Dudes that wear tattoos and blackjack leather boots up to their thighs. They hang out on the street corners at nighttime with chains and whips and badges and handcuffs and tasers at their side. They they cheat on their taxes. They cheat on their wives. They beat on their own kids in the prime time. They don't smoke weed that grows naturally. They use scotch and coke and steroids to get high. They got a VIP pass with a portable computer and a helpful assistant at their side with a fat briefcase full of secret files that are actually lies written by spies that hide the crossed keys of hell and death inside. Black suit, blue suit, gray suit, button down shirt, red, white, blue tie. I've seen these guys with my own naked eyes and I tell no lies when I surmise that they are evil in its worst disguise. I said they are evil in its worst disguise. You know they are evil in its worst disguise. Call me a mad poet, call me a fool or a clown, but I've memorized those lullabies that make the white supremacists frown and I recite my rituals out loud until my locks touch the ground. Everyone take a look around. Look at the faces of the people that are in the room here right now. Everyone that's in the room, take a good look around. 40 years from now, if the human species is still around, everyone's going to have kinky hair, and everyone's skin is going to be black and brown, and there's not going to be anything except for inbred cartoon characters whose eyes are completely round. They say the beautiful are not yet born, but when I look around at the faces of the babies in the strollers in my town, the children who will unify humanity are already here and now. So the nonsense of supremacists and Babylon's bombs will be drowned out by the laughter of the beautiful children and the cheers from the poetry crowds, by the laughter of the beautiful children and the cheers from the poetry crowds, by the laughter from the beautiful children and the cheers from the poetry crowds. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> um, uh, when I accidentally came across um, this event, I realized one thing, like as I was preparing, when I was just put on the roster, when I didn't really even think that I would be standing here today, that most of the things that we come together to do as young people are not really by accident. They are things that are being planned by 
the universe to bring us together to, to create change in the world. I came here like uh, a year and three months ago, never been out of Africa, from a little country called Zimbabwe, where I don't hear people speak as freely as people do here, where I don't get to be in classes where I can say anything about absolutely anyone and I can just I can just hear other people's minds and we can get to debate. I didn't get that. That's why I didn't finish my first degree but I'm still doing my masters. That's why I still believe in human rights and I still believe in people. So when I figured out that you had used outspoken who I have believed in for a very long time who I talk to often and who is one of my closest friends, I discovered that it wasn't by accident that I'm standing here. And it reminded me that what, what we have done, like me and outspoken, we met through hip hop and poetry, a spoken word. And it just reminded me that the topics we used to say, we were, we were saying them with such conviction that one day, someday, the world will grow smaller but then bring them close to our big ideas. And uh, so I think that as I stand here, I'm looking at people with very big ideas to share with that world that is growing smaller. And I can't think of a better place to do it. And I can't think of a better medium to do it except through hip hop. And I, when I think of hip hop, I think it's like I've always told myself it's an abbreviation and people keep telling me, why are you saying this? You should patent it before someone steals it. I don't care. Take it. I don't need it if it's only for me and I patent it. But hip hop to me just means how indigenous plans help ordinary people. A hip hop artist who is practical, a hip hop artist who says something that can uh, change at least even the smallest uh, insignificant change, the most smallest insignificant change. If a hip hop artist can do that, if they don't restrict themselves to speaking less and only talking more about useless gadgets, then hip hop will become one of the social activist tools. So this, this piece that I'm going to do for you, I wrote when I was starting to understand the whole idea of genocide. I, had, I knew that uh, some of the people from the tribe I come from, even when I say tribe, I think it's a way to um, kind of desensitize people to, to the conflicts that actually happen in Africa. It's not about tribes. It's about things bigger than that. But when I wrote this piece, um, I, I thought to particularly look at two uh, places, and that's Rwanda and... Um, Germany, the Holocaust, and I thought to present them in, a, in an artistic way, but also hope that someone who listens to hip hop can stretch themselves to listen and really get to go and read more. So it goes something like, Hotel Rwanda, those who checked in became corners. The waiters were nothing but thugs from street corners. Bread and breakfast that was poisoned without warning. Cleaners found traces of blood in the morning. Shit soaking with the blood of an innocent tribe. Never got to check out, only a few survived. Those alive lived to tell the tale of how the hotel staff crept in at night and ripped all the females. The rooms became jails and beds with sharp nails dug deep into the skin. And at once the lungs failed up to the Day, the hotel manager's own bail. The hotel still recording the highest sales of the rooms of manslaughter. To the sons and daughters, the world is full of slow poisons. Watch what you order. You might need rest, but avoid Hotel Rwanda, because you might just wake up six feet under. You might need rest, but avoid Hotel Rwanda, because you might just wake up six feet under. Wake up six feet under. Wake up six feet under, because you might just never wake up. Once upon a time, they were Jews in an Aryan race, and they both chose to run and compete for first place. The stadium was packed with the blue eyed supporters. Also present was the Gestapo to keep order. The blue eyed and the Jews took the places. The blue eyed with a smug look upon their faces. 
saluted the man with the gun like hi Hitler, like them on his back was a black swastika. The Jews waited for the gun to go off, of course, but couldn't move. They were chained to the Holocaust, so it's obvious they lost, because even if they shined, they would have found sharpshooters waiting at the finish line. After the race, it was back to the camps and no one asked. Only a guard spoke behind a gas mask. So when you run, watch the man with the gun. He could be Hitler from a race that is already won. So when you run, watch the man with the gun. He could be Hitler from a race that is already won. That is already won. That is already won. Thank you. So I just want to say uh, what an honor it is to be here with, with poets of this caliber. I mean, John Akpata, I came here six years ago for the first festival of national like spoken word. That was the word limbics at the time. We're not allowed to say that anymore. Um, and uh, this man has kept me going. <laughs> you know, people like Faye have kept me going. Just knowing that there are more people out there who, who are doing this and who are saying, you need to be out there. Um, in Ottawa, there happens to be a dearth of, of female spoken word artists right now. It doesn't mean it has to always be that way. We're, we have a lot of upcoming women, but I think it's the co competition that scares a lot of people away, and it's, it's not about the competition. We call it a slam just to get people out. Slam sounds exciting. <laughs> so uh, the poem that I'm going to do, my name is Danielle, by the way, <laughs> uh, is about kind of like a, a manifesto, a mission statement, and I'm an optimist, and I know that's kind of a, st a sad thing to be <laughs> in this day and age, and people are like, really? Op optimism like that cynicism is the way to go you know and I just it, it hurts a lot of the time <laughs> so uh, I do a lot of work in classes with uh, kids from 5 to 18 and so a lot of my poetry is geared to a younger audience but I still think this stands strong it's it's my call to action and uh, every time I perform it I remember why I do what I do And then you can laugh, because it's kind of funny in some parts. <laughs> Not everything has to be serious all the time. When I was 12 years old, I made a promise to myself. I promised myself that everything I do it for you, everything I do, I do it for you by Brian Adams, my favorite song for the rest of my life. Needless to say, it's not. But that got me to thinking, how many promises have I broken? And how beholden am I to the person that I was, that I am, that I will be? For instance, I know now that I don't need that cherry red convertible Miata that I promised myself when I was 13 and on a band trip in Regina. I become more environmentally conscious and realize I don't really need that car. I, it couldn't hold my friends uh, and on a trip across the country. And I'm okay with that. When I was 14, I said I'd never have big hair, wear high heels, makeup, or those jeans you have to zip up with a pair of pliers. Okay, so sometimes... My glasses are going to come off. <laughs> I have big hair. But it's different, I swear. But those jeans, not until hell freezes over am I going to try to get myself into something that doesn't fit, looks uncomfortable, and won't allow me to sit. Those things all seemed really important then. And looking back, I think I made mostly the right decisions. But what about my core self? Those things I believed to be key, the characteristics, values, and beliefs that I thought made me, me. Have I broken those promises? Looking at my cousin, who was my idol when I was a kid, a wild, open-minded, do what she had to do and did not bend to any one kind of woman. The kind of woman who stood up for what she thought was right and she was my map. I was going to be like her. I was going to make a difference. Fifteen years later, I'm sitting at that same woman's 50th birthday party. She adopted two beautiful children, rejoined the Catholic Church even though they shunned her for living in sin and wouldn't let me explain what a drag show was to her 13-year-old son because he needed to be protected from that kind of thing. So I had to let him believe that my friend, the drag queen, was a female race car driver. My cousin, she said, you can't always be open-minded. Sometimes you have to take community where you can find it. And now her children are her everything. And I can respect that. But I can't reconcile the fact that someday I might grow up and forget who I am. I read once that rebellion is a phase. And the fact that someone wrote that sentence down made me sad because there's one promise that I made to myself that I continue to make every day is that I want my life to make a difference on some level. I don't want to get that comfortable job and teach my children to stand by while the injustices in the world continue. But now I'm afraid that my dad's constant encouragement for me to get comfortable so that he doesn't have to worry anymore. And I really don't want him to worry. 
will make me go over to the other side, adopt that politically liberal, fiscally conservative lifestyle because it's easier than standing up for what I think is right. But there are some promises that are too important to break and I'm gonna find a way. I'm gonna keep encouraging people who have things to say. I'm gonna volunteer for the underdog and keep helping people find a way to get along because there are kids out there who, like me, need a role model to stand strong and believe that we can make a difference. And that's a promise that I need to keep. I'm short. <laughs> that, explain to me, it's like a squirt gun. You have to make it get in your mouth. It's very bizarre. <laughs> I'm intimidated by it. <sighs> Anyways. Uh, so I'm Faye Bastrel. Um, I guess I'll explain my poem after I do it. It's called uh, Her Story Lesson. How could you, she asked me, how could you want to hear my story when you sneer at the curves of these shorelines, these hills and these valleys, weigh these round mounds pound for pound instead of appreciating the bounty that is this beauty? How could you, she asked me. How could you want to hear my story when you let these men come with their fire and their metal with their hungry shovels, calling each dark spot or barbaric blemish a savage scar while they dig deep and dig deeper, taking forcefully what is mine to gently give, what is mine become their minds to fuel the desires of empires? How could you? She asked me, how could you want to hear my story when you let these burnished bronze villages and cities of melanin be coated in the cream of their crop until only pale husks remain a testament to the shame attached to those of darker frames until my very loved ones see me as unnatural and stained? How could you, she asked me, I am your mother. That stoop in your back that they compare to a monkey slouch was actually sent that loving gaze towards the rice fields that your ancestors harvested you got that from me. That flat nose on your round face that they compare to a monkey's face but is actually a sign of nobility that your ancestors treasured you got that from me. And those slanted eyes they compare to a monkey's shifty squint was actually a sign of that loving gaze towards the suns and stars that your ancestors revered. You got that from me, so how could you? She asked me, I am your mother, torn from my embrace by the jaws of civil strife and corruption, given into the arms of another, raised on a tongue your ancestors never spoke on a history your ancestor was never a part of, and standards of beauty that make your ancestors something to be ashamed of. How could you? She asked me, I am your mother. I'm Maharlika, the Pearl of the Orient, the eight rays, sun, and three stars, the land of 7,000 islands, but you know me by the name of a Spanish king that has never even seen my shores. I am your mother, the Philippines, and you turned your back to me, forgot my face, my voice, my story. Why didn't you start from the take and breaking and enslaving me until there was nothing left but American raised, corrupt, bloody minded aristocracy masquerading as democracy? But how could you? She asked me. You weren't even born then. To see revolution after root of revolution, how I kept standing up. Even when they beat me down, even when they took away everything, I was unbowed because I knew my suns and my stars were spread across the globe, making the world their oyster and their home. So how could you, she asked me. How could you want to hear my stories if you don't already know, as if you've never been conquered, manipulated, segregated, and brought low, only to rise again and again, creating a community of allies and lines as distant as the red maple leaf in Turtle Island, to build a community that even your ancestors and your descendants would be proud of? So how could you, she asked me. How could you want to hear my story as if you don't already know that I am your mother and my story is your own? So in May, I went back to the Philippines after uh, I immigrated here when I was three, and then I visited uh, my family when I was 19, and then in May, I came back uh, for a social justice mission. We were there to observe the elections, but I was also talking to political prisoners, and so um, I wrote another poem, which I don't have with me, unfortunately, but it was about more about the political situation there and the corruption. It has a lot of Tagalog words which is the Filipino language, or the one of the official, we have like thousands of dialects. It's like a giant island smorgasbord, so. Um, yeah, so I couldn't, uh, but maybe one day we'll hear that poem on YouTube. This poem is on YouTube, so if you're like, oh, this is so awesome, just Google it. <laughs> what? YouTube.
Anyways, um, so that was my inspiration for this poem, as well as just like growing up in Canada and uh, actually, well, I grew up in Toronto. Toronto, what? And uh, so that influenced a lot of what this poem is about, as well as struggling with like, I guess, in university, I learned to call this post-colonial identity. And um, so that's what this poem was about. Any questions? <laughs> For anyone, those guys with the cool hair and me. Before we go to round two, does anybody have <coughs> any questions? I, I do. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> What what motivates you? Do you want us to stand up there, or do you want yeah. us to stand up there? Or just before you you go up again, maybe the the next time. But what what motivates you when you took look at the world around you and the inside of who you are? Like what when you get that inspiration to write that next piece? What is it that you're building on that you that you find most outrageous and ridiculous and 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 how do you translate that into your poetry and, and make it come alive? Because all of your poetry is so extraordinary and empowering and, and politically provocative um, and shows a kind of resistance that I think we need more of in our world. And so I'm just wondering how you harness that um, so that we can maybe inspire ourselves to harness it as well. So just answer that question before you Yeah, if, if you could, I guess that, that's okay with you guys, yeah. Is it this one? Yeah. Uh, so I guess the question is, what what inspires or motivates me? Um, long story short, I was born and raised in an environment of love, and I was always encouraged to express myself and uh, to try new things and to join teams and groups, and I was uh, allowed to succeed and I was allowed to fail from time to time. <laughs> and uh, even in my failures, I was still loved, so I have what's known as self-esteem. Um, <laughs> it's true. Um, and here's where this, the, the, the clincher, I think I'm special. So because I think I'm special, I don't really think that the rules apply to me. <laughs> because I'm never gonna go out of my way to harm another human being. I'm never going to go out of my way to damage property, and I really go out of my way to not lie. Sometimes I have to be brutally honest, even about myself. And when there are forces in the world that are preventing me from achieving my own happiness, and when there are forces in the world that are preventing other people from achieving their own happiness, let alone existing in a state of love, it really bothers me because we're spending our money and we're training people to make other people suffer. And I have a problem with that. <laughs> it really hurts my heart. And then you do research on it, and it hurts your mind as well, because you realize that there's facts and statistics to back up what's hurting you. And um, I've been that way my whole life, from at least grade, at least in kindergarten, I was that way. And um, there's all sorts of millions of role models in the world that you can latch on to to see what happens when you stand up against injustice. When I, they tell you this in your final year at university uh, in literature. They don't tell you in year one because everyone would quit. <laughs> they tell you that the only writers that really mattered were those people that were banned or exiled or imprisoned or assassinated. And then you go, well, I don't want any of those things. <laughs> but then you realize that uh, worse things happen to better people. Like Bob Marley was, they shot him and his wife. Before they tried to assassinate him. John Lennon was assassinated. Like, how did Gandhi die? He got shot. So in the face of these things, you have to, you know, do what Danielle said. You have to try and maintain some optimism. Um, it can't go on like this forever. Uh, the bad guys can't always be in charge. The forces of destruction are not as powerful as the forces of creation. Otherwise, there'd be nothing here. And we're here, so 
we got stuff to do. So I guess this next, I was going to do a different poem, but I'm going to do this one because it's, it's kind of fun. Um, I, I write uh, serious poetry uh, at the highest level that I can with all the fancy university dictionary words and whatnot. And uh, I like doing that because I bring it to the politicians and the power structure to their face. Uh, that's a thrill. Um, but I, like this morning, I was at a grade school <laughs> doing workshops for like teenagers. So I'm like, okay, every once in a while you got to dumb it down or at least not even dumb it down, just write at the level that they can understand, right? Like Malcolm X said, break it down in a language that everybody can easily understand. So this will explain um, my foray into politics. This poem is called Coffee Bean. Oh. Okay, <laughs> how many people in the room drink coffee? Show of hands. Put your hands up nice and high. Okay, how many people that drink coffee have ever grown their own coffee beans? How many people in the room smoke cigarettes? Yeah. How many people that smoke cigarettes or cigars or tobacco or pipes or whatever have ever grown their own tobacco? The number one rule of slavery is slaves do not grow their own crops. Not for food, not for medicine, not for pleasure, not for profit. That's the number one rule of slavery. Slaves do not grow their own crops. Not for food, not for medicine, not for pleasure, not for profit. And anybody here, if I gave you a green coffee bean, which is actually a coffee seed, would you be able to take that green coffee bean, which is actually a coffee seed, and put it in the earth? and give it the water and the nutrients and the sunshine and the air and the time that it needs to allow itself to turn itself into a coffee tree. And if you could, take that green coffee bean, which is actually a coffee seed, and put it in the earth and give it the water and the nutrients and the sunshine and the air and the time that it needs to allow itself to turn itself into a coffee tree, how would you induce that coffee tree to produce you coffee beans instead of coffee seeds? Does anybody know? You're all addicted to a psychotropic stimulant that you have never, ever grown and you have never, ever seen. Does that sound like slavery to you? Sounds like slavery to me. You wake up in the morning to a bell or a buzzer or a machine. You run into another room so you can go to another machine so you can filter hot water through your coffee beans so you can have your cup of coffee in the morning because you're addicted to caffeine. You are addicted to caffeine. You're addicted to caffeine. You're addicted to caffeine. You're addicted to caffeine. You're addicted to a psychotropic stimulant that you have never, ever grown and you have never, ever seen. Does that sound like slavery to you? Sounds like slavery to me. You get into another machine which takes you from point A to point B, work or school, wherever you're supposed to be. You sit down in front of a radioactive computer screen and instantaneously your brain has a chemical craving, a reflex reaction to desire for nicotine. Is it 10.15? Is it 10.15? Is it 10.15? Are you going to Tim Hortons or Timothy's or Second Cup or Starbucks? Will you please get something for me, a double, 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 please, because I'm jonesing, I need my fix, I need my caffeine and my nicotine, won't go back to work without caffeine and nicotine, can't continue my day without caffeine and nicotine, won't finish school without caffeine and nicotine. Does that sound like slavery to you? It sounds like slavery to me. And some people, some people have the nerve, some people have the gall, some people have the audacity to tell me, me, of all people, me, after I've run in three elections federally, that it's okay for you to have coffee and cigarettes, but I'm not supposed to smoke my own homegrown weed. Does that sound like slavery to you? Well, it sounds like slavery to me. Wow, wow, what, what, what motivates me? <laughs> Laughter. Um, hearing people tell you something so serious and you laugh about it, then after that you're like, why am I laughing? <laughs> um, <coughs> I grew up in this small town, an old location, in a place called Bulawayo, second capital of Zimbabwe. Uh, it's the oldest location and it's also the oldest slum where I come from. So I guess what motivates me? Well, when I started off, I saw 
poverty, didn't know what it was, but felt inside of me that I wasn't poor for some reason. Felt that for some reason, from the things that I saw, the, 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 the wire cars that I tried to make from, from the whatever junk you could grab hold of, the, the, the guns, unfortunately, you'd make out of bamboo sticks, you know, and like, I felt that was, there was something rich inside that created. Whether at that time it knew how to create negatively or positively, I created. And I read books, and I read books, and read books. Because I wanted to escape what at that time I thought was reality before knowing that it was a construct. That people were not meant to grow up in such a place in the first place. That it was an experiment just to keep people constricted. That the beer halls that our fathers staggered out of, that um, the malls that our sisters went to and never bought anything but always talked about, oh wow, I would love to get those stilettos but never got them in the end. That those dreams were superficial created to make them feel like somehow they could get all these things that would make them forget that they're poor. I'm motivated by the fact that I didn't think I was poor. This was impossible to stand in front of you. However, thousands or ten thousands of miles away from a place where people grow up and sit in trenches and drink opaque beer and dream just because they want to forget they are poor. I knew I was rich. I'm here because I'm rich. That's what motivates me. Whether I, I, I do get rich financially or not, whatever it is, if I'm rich inside here, nothing else outside of me will govern me and try to convince me that the riches I have here mean nothing. So that's what motivates me. This piece, <laughs> this piece I'm, I'm going to do um, is about, like in 2008, um, there were xenophobic attacks that occurred in South Africa uh, against other nationalities uh, from Zimbabwe, Nigeria, other places. And it got me thinking about those constructs. Like, what made them in the post-apartheid era to see another African as not like them? It was those co constructs. It's not like they didn't see that. They just saw themselves looking at a mirror and they, it, it, it mirrored their own economic stress. It mirrored their own failure to, to confront their own uh, politicians. It mirrored their own fear of being poor and having someone take it away, take the little that they have away from them. So I wrote this short hip hop piece where I was asking like, well, what's happened to, 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 to Africans? Well, what's happened to, to us seeing each other that way? Is it about property? Is it about, is it about poverty? Is it about democracy? And so I say something like this. What, 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 what hypocrisy could never imagine another African harming me the agony or believing we're living in harmony. Democracy suddenly turned to a laughable fallacy. Anarchy, could it possibly be part of the prophecy? Simply someone taking a poor African's grocery, snatching the rosaries, uh, burning the property. Could this mean that we've totally been blinded by poverty? Children of the same ovaries, born of royalty, given these galaxies, and yet fighting over these territories. Pardon me, I might be falsely conceived as a nemesis. I choose the cadastry of the cadastry of ancestry for all its benefits. Imagine this on television, no paper centerpiece, giving the evidence that they're ter terrorizing your relatives. We're losing Africans while counting the negatives. Live and let live, because African love is affirmative. Live and let live, because African love is affirmative. Live and let live, live and let live and let live. Thank you. Two minutes.
at the end of Thank You Guys. Yeah. So of course. Know that. Sorry. No, <laughs> there's never enough time. But meanwhile, there's a ton of spoken word events going on in the city. You just Google Slam, spoken word, and it doesn't have to end here, right? The conversation, we can take it in the hall, right? So um, what motivates me? Everybody said where they're from. I'm from northern Manitoba, um, north of 53rd Parallel. So uh, I guess I've seen, you know, a lot of things that you'd have to go to the PA to check out. <laughs> Um, but I want to do a piece, a short piece. What motivates me is whatever I see. Like, I am constantly, you see things. Things happen to you, and uh, it's all real. And sometimes you just want to write about it because you know it's happening to somebody else, too. This is a piece I wrote for the 29th annual Take Back the Night March in Ottawa. And uh, it's based on two incidents. One at Kent and Gladstone. Two, actually, at Kent and Gladstone. One where uh, a man was following me and uh, had the good sense to book it. <laughs> and uh, another where I'm following a woman and she's afraid of me. So I've juxtaposed both those situations and uh, created a poem out of it. And it's super quick, so. I'm scared too. I'm scared too. I'm walking behind you, but I'm scared too. Two women, one street, this street with no cars, three street lights out, gray pavement, locked buildings, empty parking lots, this street quiet. Only the sound of our footsteps is the same street where a man followed me with a rolled up newspaper smacking the palm of his hand. I crossed the street, he crossed the street. One car passed. I walked confidently until I hit the corner and turned hidden by buildings I ran, ran the fear and breath right out of me. This is that street, it's dark, it's late, and I can see you cringe every time you hear my footstep pounding. I see you tilt your head slightly, trying to catch a glimpse of the stranger behind you. I keep my pace steady, I don't quicken my step, I don't want to frighten you because I'm scared too. I'm scared too. I'm walking behind you, but I'm scared too. I don't want you to run away. With you in front of me, I feel safe. I wish I could ask if we could walk together, but the newspaper bred paranoia and media fed fear whispering that you could be Carla Homolka in my ear. And that's what keeps me back, giving you little heart attacks with my presence. We just want to get home safe, and I just want to tell you that it's okay. My keys in my hand, if anything happens, I've got your back. We're in this together, all of us, men and women. Because I'm scared too. Okay, so I'm just gonna drop this quick piece and then answer your question after that, so. It's cool. <clears throat> Hello, do you feel savage, barbaric, less than ideal, bored of your rich oral traditions, tired of living close to the earth, fed up with a symbiotic relationship of humans and animals, suddenly doubting the validity of the herbal knowledge that sustained your community for hundreds of years, apathetic with a cultural heritage that's integral to your self-worth ever felt deep down on some intrinsic level that you weren't actually human. We'll suffer no more, introducing the civilizer. The civilizer comes with freedom, democracy, equality, individualism, the pursuit of happiness and morals and ethics, all completely free. Benefits include a fair and democratic society mostly used by the rich and incorporated allopathic medicinal industry driven to sell you cures instead of actually curing you an education to produce productive cogs in our beloved capitalist system. Material success symbolized by corporately invented names of products you don't actually need and best of all whiteness, heterosexuality, one form of masculinity, one form of body arrangement, body type, one form of relationship arrangement, one form of monotheism, monotheism, and one form of golden standard that we should all try to achieve. This and more is scientifically proven to come from the civilizer. But wait, don't just stand there like a fence-sitting bisexual or a no-good sturdy savage. If you order now, we have a very special offer where we take all the terrible parts of you that make you inhuman plus your natural resources and cheap labor and replace them with the civilizer's benefits, but now with 50% more democracy and 200% more freedom. If you call within the next 10 minutes, we'll even throw in a special offer where we give you crippling guilt and self-hatred as you strive towards the civilizer's ideals but can't quite break free of your inferior indigenous roots. So what are you waiting for? This is a limited time offer only. Order the civilizer today. Dominators are standing by. Some side effects may include colonialism, culture, genocide, debt, diaspora, exploitation, free trade agreements, ghettoization, Islamophobia, homophobia, misogyny, obesity, poverty, patriarchy, slavery, starvation, sweatshops, free of violence, and war. The civilizer refuses to be held responsible for any and all side effects that may ensue. The civilizer 
cleaning up our world one nation at a time. I don't usually drink caffeine, so this caffeine Tim Hortons fix, I'm like, da, 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 da. anyways, um, yes, so what motivates me? Um, <laughs> I guess, uh, where am I from? Well, I'm from the Philippines, and I'm also from Scarborough. Does anyone know where Scarborough is? <laughs> so uh, I did not exactly grow up in an environment that I would call John Potter-esque. <laughs> <laughs> And um, so, I mean, for a while, I mean, when you when you grow up in Scarborough, you think, okay, so this is your life. You're just going to, you know, when you're 15, pop out like five kids and then get addicted to drugs and maybe shoot some guys in the mall or whatever. And uh, But I was a big nerd, so I didn't want to do that. And so I read a lot of books, and then I got addicted to video games, then I got out of video games and, like, you know, role-playing games and whatever. But what with the nerdiness <laughs> and the desire not to become a stereotype in Scarborough... Um, fuel this like creative urge to do stuff and not just like you know do poetry and be famous and get lots of chicks and dudes to like yeah take me home because you're famous but no I mean I wanted to do things and volunteer for organizations and make a difference and be something more than statistic so that's what motivates me thank you <laughs> Um, unfortunately, we've, we've run out of time, but I, I wanted to thank you so much for joining us today. You have really, I, I, I hope you all feel the same, but I, I've really inspired me. Um, you've brought together many of the themes, but besides that, I think the way that you use language and are able to put it together and the themes that you address are just absolutely inspirational. So on behalf of the rest of the class, I thank you so much for taking the time and coming here and being with us. Um, we have a small token of our appreciation for you. Cookies? And um, <laughs> it's a psychotropic drug. <laughs> um, we have small little thank yous. John. This is the first thing that Carl has ever <laughs> <laughs> and thank you. And faith. So thank you so much. Thank you, students. Woo!